you are now checking out The Win Podcast Where the everyday people are the celebrities So, so let's, let's get, get to know them, them. I've seen this guy play in the Apollo Theater, uh, the Bowie Ballroom, and he played with one of my favorite artists as well, Charles Bradley, uh, Lee Fields, Sharon Jones. The list goes on and on and on. And I'm just so humbled and honored to, you know, sit down with this dude and just talk about his life and music. So, everybody, check out Mr. Billy Oxtick. I always mess up the names. You're right on it. (laughs) Yeah, you got it. What's, nice. up? What's up, y'all? Also known as Billy the Kid. This is true. That's what I found out about that uh, probably like a couple weeks ago because I just knew you as Billy. I didn't know it was Billy the Kid also. This is true. <laughs> Early nickname from mm. the Dabtone family. Nice. Because Dope. they pretty much picked me out of, you know, college. So Dope. I was still a kid. <laughs> and yeah, and we're, we're going to go into that. So, yeah. <laughs> Billy, I know you as like, you know, the, the trumpet player. Mm. But now I want to get to know you like... Everything. So, like, my first question to you is, who are you? (laughs) I would hopefully say I'm just a cool guy Mm. uh, who really enjoys performing music, uh, writing songs. um, I don't know, someone who people can collaborate with well, um, open-minded, hopefully funny (laughs) and fun to be around. Um, yeah, and I, I think I'm now a result of New York. Like, mm. I've changed for the better uh, drastically since I moved here um, in 2009 uh, to, where, go, to go to school here. Where did you uh, come from? From Chicago, originally. Mm. Born and raised. Um, grew up just outside of the city uh, uh, with my family. And uh, yeah, it was there... From day one until I moved out to come here. Was um, it like a big transition coming from like Chicago to New York? Because I don't know what, I mean, you hear stories about Chicago being very, you know, violent and stuff like that in certain areas. And of course, just like anywhere else, you have your good areas. Was it like a big transition for you coming from Chicago to now the New York life and getting the bacon, egg and cheese, you know, in the morning and all that stuff? <laughs> we didn't have any of those back there. That was, that was a fire transition. But, uh, I would say by the point that I made the move, I was very ready, both mentally mm. and musically, but definitely was a big change of scenery because I grew up in the suburbs, gotcha. I was born in the city, grew up in the suburbs, um, and but had just been surrounded by music from super early. And so the thought of New York being my home was pretty comforting just because of that music culture and I knew that I had a good shot of, mm. of getting better and succeeding because of that culture and because I was already so well versed in music in general from my upbringing yeah, um, yeah I, I had started playing trumpet when I was in fourth grade um, my mom is a piano player has been since she was young wow piano around the house all the time. Uh, My brother was a alto saxophone player. (laughs) He's five years older than me. And so he kind of led the horn charge, Mm -hmm. like in our family, inspired me a lot. He was in jazz band, classical, did all that in school. And so I kind of saw what he was doing Mm -hmm. and really liked it, but really liked the trumpet sections Mm -hmm. in all those bands that he was in. And so I literally remember the moment, I think I was watching one of his high school concerts and I like went to my mom, I like pointed at the trumpet section. I was like, I want to do that. That's what, how old were you at, at that? I was probably, yeah, fourth grade. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and they had a really badass trumpet player, mm. I remember. He was like a real great lead player mm-hmm. and he just like sounded amazing. And so that just kind of triggered that for me what was the music that you guys because you mm-hmm. said it like pretty much twice already like 
you, you know, the music around the house, you know, your mom's playing piano. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, did, what did your dad play? Did he play uh, anything? He didn't play anything, although he was, he was the a, manager. He was a deadhead. <laughs> okay, okay. Nice. <laughs> little, known fact, I'm going to now publicly say that. <laughs> a lot of people in my family know it, but not a lot of mm. my friends know that. Mm. But he was a huge dead fan, mm. Jerry Garcia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he loves all sorts of music. And so he was kind of the music lover. My mom was actually performing a little bit. Um, it still does today. She's actually the church piano player and MD at their, um, in their town. Um, How did like the soulful music come into play? So, you know, cause I can, I can yeah. imagine just being in your house and maybe they're playing so many types of different types of things. Mm-hmm. What was it for you? Cause I mean, I only seen you play like in a lot of soulful bands. So what was it for you when I guess when you started first hearing maybe soulful music? So that that was definitely a recent development mm. for sure. Um, from an early age, I was playing a lot of jazz, a lot of like big band mm. stuff, um, just because that's kind of what you did in school. Um, also a lot of classical. Yeah. So I studied pretty intensely classical trumpet and jazz trumpet. But until really when I made the move here to New York and met Daptone Mm -hmm. and all those guys, I didn't really play soul music or even really listen to it. Wow. Like I knew the hits, obviously, but like not nearly what I For you to say, it's like, man, I was listening to all these guys, maybe Lee Morgan or. uh, Yeah, so that was me. Yeah, that was useless to Lee Morgan, John Coltrane. Um, Blakey, yeah, Clifford yeah, Brown, exactly. Drew Mitchell, but then like the probably like the soulful stuff that you probably get into. Maybe I don't know, like uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. Uh, Stevie Wonder, probably yeah. like the hits you probably was listening to, but nothing yeah. like all this. Take, not, take out Otis Brown the third. I'm like, who's that? None like, of the deep cuts. <laughs> yeah, I was was definitely not collecting records or like any of that until really, um, yeah, Charles found me. And, wow! And like made that, and I, you know, like I said mm. earlier, um, dropped out of college. Yeah, dropped out of jazz studies in college, um, which was my major, to basically go on tour with a soul band. And I was, I had really no idea what I was getting into because, first of all, no one knew who Charles was at that point mm-hmm. in like 2010. I joined the band in 2011. Um, so it was a leap, you know, regardless. Um, but musically, it had all been kind of leading to that mm-hmm. point. I was in a couple bands in New York. Um, one in particular called MFA that mm-hmm. my, one of my best friends, Miles Arnson, started. Uh, we were in school together, same age. And we were starting to play a lot of soul-influenced stuff, a lot of Afrobeat. Um, so there were already wheels turning yeah. in that direction. Life was already preparing you somehow for this moment. Totally. And so when it did happen, I was like, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm ready. So uh, yeah. there's a couple of things. I'm, I'm, Sorry, it's I'm great. jumping around. No, around. that's <laughs> great. That's great. Because now like, I'm going to form it all together. Mm-hmm. And we're going we're gonna to dive into that. So when yeah. that happened, because yeah. I read in an article the first time they came, says, hey, you know, come on down with Charles Bradley and tour with us and blah, blah. And he was like, no, I got like this finals week, totally. all this stuff, you know, teachers are telling you something, your parents are probably telling you something too as well. Yeah. And it's like, you know, respectfully decline, you know, and then the opportunity comes again, yes. which is like sometimes hard to even get a one opportunity. Totally. And it comes to you again. Totally. <laughs> what made you, two part quote, what made you say yes this time around? And then, how did you manage to stand your ground and face your teachers like, I don't think that's a right move. Your parents like, listen, you've been doing this classical stuff, jazz, stay in this lane, not the soul music. You know what I'm saying? And it's hard sometimes to make those decisions when you, your spirit is telling you, this is, this is the opportunity. And plus, you're looking all around, you're like, this is the second time someone comes up to me. Mm-hmm. So what made you say yes? And how difficult it was for you to, to, face, to face yourself, to be like, I'm, I'm good. I, I want to see what this is about. Yeah. So the first time it happened, like you said, it was right before all these tests were happening. And I was like just about to finish my second year. So 
I felt like at that crossroads, I was just like, okay, I just need to finish my second year of college. I right. can't leave like them in the dust. Mm -hmm. That would have been <coughs> weird. It mm -hmm. just would have felt weird. And it worked out with the timing because they actually, they brought someone in who didn't end up working out. Mm. And then they were like, Billy, can, are you free now? And basically that was like a month before my third year was about to start. And so I had mentally just enough time to be like, okay, let me just take a step back and see what my life is going to look like, right. you know, if I do this. I had a little bit more breathing room to, to just like, you know, take a look at it all. And, but it definitely was like a major crossroads with me and right. my family. Uh, <laughs> took like a lot of phone calls mm. to convince them. Uh, and they actually <laughs> took it upon themselves to call all my professors <laughs> and like check with them be like, what do you think? Mm. Should he do this? And luckily, I'm a shout out my homies. Mm. Lenny Pickett was one of my professors from the SNL band, um, nice. Tower Power. Oh. One of the most OG dudes ever. And he vouched for me and vouched for the opportunity. <laughs> Also, Brian Lynch is was one of my trumpet professors. Uh, he had played with Art Blakey, Eddie Palmieri, like one of the most heavy <laughs> trumpet players ever. And he was my like closest professor for trumpet. And he he was aware, thank God, he was aware of Daptown, and he knew like how cool that shit mm -hmm. was. And so when he heard that that was my opportunity, right. he was able to tell them this is this totally checks out. I can vouch for them. And they literally had phone calls with my parents wow. like, it's cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, at least let them go for a semester. Yeah. And so that was the plan at first. Like, I was, I was going to go, it was like a four-week or three-week states tour. And then, like, um, maybe like a, actually, I think it was like a six-week Europe tour that they had booked. <laughs> and so my whole semester would have been out. And then I was going to come back. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And then seven years later, you know, I was still in the band. And you're like, I'm, I'm going to come back. I just, yeah, exactly. I just, yeah. I didn't yeah. say my, when. My dad <laughs> is still like, so when, when are you going back to school? But, you know, so that's kind of all how it went down. But I'm really, really thankful that, like, it all happened when it did. So know? here you are now jumping into this whole new world, I would say. Like, mm -hmm. you know, respectfully, because you, you, you're from the jazz, you're from classical. But mm -hmm. you got the chops. You got the training. Mm -hmm. You got the passion, because when I see you play, you have the passion, which I want to touch on. Um, and now you are with these dudes. Did you have any connection with them besides them? Like, did, like before, say, hey, come on the roll. Did you kind of like build a relationship before that? Or they just like... So the band that I mentioned that I was in in yeah. college, MFA, my best friend Miles, who's the drummer, had been drumming in Antibalas for gotcha. about a year prior. And so he had kind of introduced all of us mm -hmm. to them, and we had been like kind of mingling. Gotcha. And I became close with uh, Jordan McLean, their okay. trumpet player. Um, and it was actually Jordan who was the one who really recommended me mm -hmm. for the Charles gig. Um, and so that's how that all kind of came to be. It was it was a lot of like our band, yeah, wanting to be Auntie Ballas. And then Auntie Ball is kind of like taking us under their wing. Nice. And then when there were other opportunities in the label, they were like, okay, this guy is perfect for this. Like, nice. Like give him a shot. How um, was yeah. the opportunity and experience for you to, mm -hmm. you know, be a part of that? Like, you know, describe like that first month now or the first week you're ready to do this with these guys. Some of them you kind of know. Some of them are afraid, building new relationships. For sure. Charles Bradley, you didn't really know at all, you know, so you yeah. had to build that foundation from the ground up. Yeah. What was that for you that first week and like, you know, you know, standing your ground knowing you can do this, but of course you have the fears and mm -hmm. doubts just like anybody else. So yeah. it's like you have a lot on your plate right now, you know, mm -hmm. to go through that. Yeah. I mean, it, it all happened actually kind of naturally mm. and it was all pretty smooth. I mean, I, I don't really remember there ever being a moment. I mean, there probably was a me, like, being like, where am I? I'm scared. Yeah, yeah. But it was instantly just this, like, love mm. fest. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and Charles just being, like, 
the father figure. Mm -hmm. And then there was Tom Brennick, who was like the musical director, yeah. record producer, who became like one of my huge mentors. And He's a guitar player as well. Yeah, right? yeah. And so them two kind of leading the charge. And then the band was just perfectly assembled mm. by Tom. And like everyone just knew how to do their, mm. their shit. And like, it just gelled, mm. and I think everyone also knew how special and how like once in a lifetime yeah. it was. Like I don't know, so it made everyone just right. really just excel and quickly make that bond. Um, and then just being on the road helped us, you know, a ton because you you're with these people twenty four seven, and we're all like around the same age, except Charles, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But he's a baby. You know? <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, like yeah. a little kid. Mm -hmm. And so he became best friends with us, like instantly. Mm -hmm. um, the vibe was just there. What did you um, yeah. learn about yourself playing the, what did the instrument, the trumpet teach you about yourself? And what did it do to help you in your life starting from a young age, you know, mm -hmm. even through, through now? Because I would imagine that, you know, you know, as a musician myself, like it becomes your friend, you know, like it, it will never leave you. It will always be there. You can leave it, but it mm -hmm. was the moment you come back and pick it up, it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of messages that I learned through my uh, instruments that has been teaching me the patience or, you know, self doubt. So totally. what did the instrument provide to you? What did it teach you from like being young to like now being how, uh, in your thirties now? I am 28. In your twenties. Yeah. So, <laughs> Um, it, I think most of all, it taught, um, taught me about preparation mm -hmm. and, um, worth, you know, just work ethic and like really, I don't know, because it's, the instrument is difficult. Yeah. Very difficult. And I struggled with it even today. Mm -hmm. You know, there's good days, there's bad days, but you can't fight it and but the more that you just kind of let yourself go mm. and like embrace it embrace you know the struggle the the highs the lows mm -hmm. you know you're gonna have good gigs you're gonna have bad gigs but i think it, it taught me that most of all you know just like preparation and just like putting the work in and you and keep going no matter what exactly and you know it if you do that it's gonna definitely pay off i mean and I've seen that, like all the hours I've spent at mm -hmm. home in Chicago practicing when I could probably be out yep. causing trouble mm -hmm. definitely hooked me up. <laughs> <laughs> like, thank you, mom. Because if I hadn't have done that, none of this would have ever happened mm. for sure. Like, yeah. When I watch you play, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to watch, honestly, because um, you are playing from within. And I remember when I mentioned when I, when I mentioned that to you when I saw you at a concert recently, and I was like, ever since I seen you play, you you're in a different world, you're in a different zone, um, and you're really connecting to the instrument from within. And to me, it's beautiful to watch because I feel like you could always teach someone notes or the the the, the music, but you can't teach them how to really play from what's inside. That's some. That's a gift, you know. You, everyone's always different with that. What did you always play like that? Did you even acknowledge it or notice that? Like, what are in those moments? What are you connecting to uh, when you're really playing that instrument? And there's there's people around, but maybe there's no one around because you're in a different element. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's a singer, I definitely am connecting with the vocalist mm. a lot. I'm also definitely connecting with like the drummer mm. because I love drummers. Mm. Um, I don't know. I'll always kind of be like picking out different elements, mm. feeding off people. Mm. Um, vocalists are huge though. Like, you know, that energy that you're yeah. riding with them, especially a soul yeah. singer, you know, that's like the most intense thing ever. Mm. Yep. <laughs> and so you want to like match that energy you can't have like a weak little horn section yeah, yeah, yeah. and Charles Bradley, like it has to be here to like support him and lift him up. Mm. And so I think playing soul music taught me a lot about that. It, 
because you're not in the background, you're almost equal with the singer. Mm. Like with your parts, you listen to soul record, the horn parts are as memorable yep. as the vocal parts. So that's huge. You know, it's as if you're singing uh, with your horn. Do you ever have moments where you connect into your personal life as well? And those moments like, you know, when you connect into maybe the singer and the drummer and then now you have this instrument, has there been moments where you are connecting, maybe it reminds you of certain things of your own life and it brings it out even more? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> uh, yes, because I'm like, some, I, well, from the times I've seen you, I feel like I felt that. Uh, okay, like, yeah. He's connected some hurt right now, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. or, 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 or something within along with everybody else pitching into what he's feeling around them. Totally. Nice. Yeah, I think it, it's almost like a collective feeling when <laughs> yeah. you're playing that music. Like mm -hmm. you, you're the band, the singer is like all kind of feeling the same emotion, you know. Yeah, a happy song, a sad song. Like mm. you're all kind of, you're, you've got this little like, pot and you're like mm -hmm. you're mixing it up yep. and you're, you're throwing in all your your energy and your emotions into it together and you're kind of building it to a peak you know uh, with everyone collectively it's so um, funny because uh <clears throat> when i got into the trumpet and i'm still trying to to learn it um i it was between you know the the trumpet or maybe the the saxophone i was up mm -hmm. in the air so long story short, like I always believe like things will always uh, come to you when it's time was met. And I said, I just left it in the air. So I went to my chiropractor one day uh, to fix my back because it was hurting. <laughs> and, um, and then um, he gives me his card. He's like, yo, always reach out to me if there's any issue, blah, blah, blah. I look at his card and it's the uh, anatomy of the body. And inside the anatomy of the body where like the back and the bones, he has a trumpet there. And I go... Well, I already knew from what I believe in that was a message already being sent to Whoa. me that this will be the instrument. I looked at him and said, you play the trumpet? And he was like, yeah, I do. I was like, why? I was like, because I've been between the two, what the sax or the trumpet. And right now, this is the confirmation that <laughs> it should be the trumpet. And totally. I always connected to the trumpet. Cool. It, out of nowhere, it's just, but it was the, the hunger and the drive was even stronger. Wow. So one thing that sealed the deal not only that was he said you know the trumpet is it's so hard because what you know the, the guitar you can make the noise you're pressing something the noise is really you're making that noise yeah. and with your lips it's like he says it's just great spiritual connection you have with that trumpet that you got to form that sound from the inside yeah the moment he said that i was like that's it that's, <laughs> yeah. that is, that's the instrument that's I want. what i because what i listen to and what right. when i create my stuff it's coming from the heart. And if totally. that instrument is gonna like pull that out of me, sign me up. Totally. So totally. It's amazing to and it is amazing to see that, you know, and that's when I started doing research on a lot of trumpet players as well. And I'm like, mm -hmm. man, it, it's it's so great to see that on stage when you expressing that, like, yeah, there is a connection, a big old suit that you're connecting to and stuff like that. Totally. What was the biggest challenge you playing the trumpet? You would say like trying to get it to a certain level like oh okay i would say when you're on the road mm. <laughs> life's tough with the trumpet <laughs> because like you know you're flying every mm -hmm. day or you're on the bus every day um or you don't sleep every mm -hmm. day and uh and then you gotta play a show <laughs> for x amount of people could be a lot could be a little but um you always want to be your best right. but it's just it can be difficult like maintaining when you're out there mm -hmm. um just because you know your entire routine is out the door <laughs> you, know, you have no <laughs> time mm -hmm. for warming up no time for mm -hmm. practicing your show is your practice like wow. you don't get to practice your instrument when mm -hmm. you're on tour <laughs> like, that's just a reality yeah 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 um and so y'all you know at, like I would actually just develop these like road chops, mm -hmm. so I would just like y your body kind of actually adapts to it mm -hmm. and get used to the fact that you're just picking up your horn, maybe playing a few mm -hmm. notes, and then going right to stage. It's so funny because uh, you mentioned not too long ago that uh, the trumpet was teaching you dedication and work ethic, and here you are on the road, and I'm making this connection now. The trumpet was coming back and teaching you that again on the road because it knows that you yeah. can easily, because it's just the road life. This is what it is. You can easily slip up totally. and 
something that I learned from the trumpet, like you can tell if you haven't played in a while. Like you can feel that. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> but here's the trumpet already like, yeah. all right, let's do let's build some like naturally your trumpet in your body is like, let's build something up that we can maintain totally with this lifestyle. Totally. Which yes. is amazing that what yeah. it was teaching you now and uh, younger yeah. continued on later on. Hundred percent. Yeah, you become like one with that thing and <laughs> you get to know it well. Mm. So but it you know, I, yeah. It's every day is different, and that's what keeps it exciting. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I don't know. If it was e- too easy, that would be no fun. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you yeah. know what's so funny is like you're, you're it's forever going to continue teaching you because when you're sixty or seventy years old, right? Mm. You know, I would imagine your body is changing. So you, the way you play when you was like younger is not going to be the same when you're older. Totally. So you know, you're going to learn something new with that journey, how to yeah. continue to play and yeah. stuff like that. Who I was watching. Where it was sad to see what he was battling with that, but he was still making it work. Oh, um, like it was, it was keep on going. Uh, t- t- Clark Terry. Clark Terry. I was just gonna, yeah. Yes, I was watching a documentary about that, and you know he's, totally. you know, getting ready to pass on and going through his motions of that and, and dealing with life, and he was still somehow play with what he was able to do, yeah. and maybe he probably was a little frustrated, but he accepted that this is what I. I'm happy doing this. Yeah. That I'm able to do this. Do something. This is where I'm at right now with the trumpet. <laughs> totally. And it's, I just connected now with you just saying that. I was like, oh man, that's so crazy. That's life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yo, you just got to take it as it comes mm-hmm. and, and just like be cool with it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and like, you know, b- do the best with what you got, I guess, is yep. what that kind of implies. Um, oh, one question I'm going to ask about that too is like mm-hmm. when you finally grab the trumpet mm-hmm. and because you, you, you said to your mom, you know, I want that. I want to play that. Mm-hmm. And that was something similar when I saw the guitar too. I was like, I want to play that. <laughs> and um, it's just it was just this connection that you know you have, and I know that yeah. feeling. Yeah. What was it when you finally grabbed it and mm. you finally got? What was if you could remember that moment and take us down that road? You know, what was that moment for you to finally grab this thing that you was eyeing? Yeah. And now it's in your hands. Yeah. Definitely special. At first, I grabbed the trombone, actually, because mm. I was like, let me check this thing out because it's got a cool slide. <laughs> but I was too little. Like, I couldn't even wow. move the slide <laughs> half of what you needed to, to play mm. it. Uh, and so they were like, here, wait, take the trumpet. I was like, oh, I, I wanted this anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so they give you a cornet when you start. So it's like a little mm-hmm. smaller version. And, um, yeah, it just felt dope. Mm. Like, it's small and compact, but, like, it's loud. And did you did you kind of feel like you almost played this before? Like, like mm. was there a feeling like you almost, like, kind of, like, played this before? Or, like, was there a moment, like, you felt like you was reunited, you were reunited with something? Or you were just, like... I think uh, I was... I felt more of, like, okay, we, now we finally can start. Mm. <laughs> Got it. Nice. Like, <laughs> It, the time is here. Nice. <laughs> like, let's, let us begin. <laughs> so, yeah. You collaborated, like, with so many artists, um, which is, like, amazing to see. And I know sometimes it can be difficult and challenging. How do you remain basically, like, true to yourself and not allow maybe ego to take over a process, over the process of either creating, playing with others, you know, because now when we're, when we're in the influence of the society and everyone around us, we can easily lose ourselves. How do you remain true to you in those situations and not allow maybe ego or anything get in the way of that? I think I just always have to remember where I came from and mm. what people have taught me along the way if I get lost um, to kind of ground myself. Mm. So if it's either like, you know, something Charles told me or something I heard somebody say at Daptone once when Mm -hmm. I was at a session. Um, I don't know. I just, I try to use like little pillars Mm. of knowledge that I've like grounded myself with as my like basis, you know, for, Mm. for jumping off. Uh, I never try to get too far away from what I actually know, Mm. you know, and not try and like either lie or like, imply yeah. that I might know more than I know uh, or if somebody's I don't know yeah. but yeah I try to just yeah. stay grounded and, and let those things what was a moment me. that um, 
-hmm. you can remember it doesn't have to be big or, or it could be something small where you had to you was in a position to have to apply that one of those lessons and you know mm -hmm. or whether it came from Charles or maybe remember something your mom said what was a moment for that where you had to like really like remind yourself I would I mean I would say it probably happens like every day <laughs> uh, <laughs> like every mm. hour of every day yeah. if I'm in the studio mm. at my studio or like planning a release or something mm. I don't know yeah it's you don't want to I I do like to test myself and like push the boundaries mm. but I I've now I've learned not to get too far ahead of myself. Gotcha. Um, and like I'm trying to just really plan things well now. That's kind of my vibe. Gotcha. <laughs> like, I don't know, just plan it out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, again, like use that knowledge that people have given me uh, as my jumping off point. Um, well, um, yeah. what were some lessons you learned from, you know, working with Charles Bradley, man? You know, and um, I remember you... In an article that I read, you know, you kind of said, uh, it's, a, it's amazing how I came from the suburbs. At one point, he was homeless. Mm -hmm. And here we are making music together, which mm -hmm. I thought was like so true how life works sometimes. And mm -hmm. it's so amazing. And what I believe in, you know, is like we all have a purpose and we're all connected somehow. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is like a definition of that. And also, I will share my Charles Bradley connections with him. I, I like don't personally know the guy, but I feel like I know the guy and I love him dearly. Mm -hmm. So, what were some lessons that you learned working with him? Because mm -hmm. not only as a, you're working with an artist, but you also got to know him on, on a human level too, as well. So, what totally. was what was some lessons there? Those moments, if you can share. Yeah, um, I mean, first of all, I mean, it just his his drive, his passion for not only music but just living mm -hmm. and like really enjoying people uh, was huge for me. Um, like, he would literally live every day like it was like his last. Mm. You know, he, like, I just never saw anyone else, like, give as much love as he did on right. a just daily basis, no and matter. Genuine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and genuine. Uh, right, because you can very well just kind of, you know, it can be yeah. fake. Um, but he was 100% real. And um, that's what made him a good soul singer. So made him a good human, uh, great friend. Um, yeah, just his, I don't know. The value um, of, like, seeing the value of life through him. And totally. being, like, a, a, a great human being, which at mm -hmm. times it's impossible sometimes to even witness that. And yeah. the times that we are now. Totally. So, so to see that. You're like, whoa. It's just, it was just clear. <laughs> clear as day. Mm. Like, this man is just so pure. Yeah. But after he had been through all this shit, like, his entire life was just failure and, mm -hmm. like, just oppression. And, you know, everyone was against him his whole life. Um, nothing went his way. You should mm. say that. But he still had that drive to start his own band, mm -hmm. have his own business, like this was back in the day, yeah. and or hitchhike across the country to like find a better place to live or try to find a, something. Mm -hmm. um, he did it all. And like I'm just, like you said, I'm so far from that life. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> just being able to like connect with him and share the stage with him was huge. Um, a lot of things, definitely, I would learn on stage as he was performing, because mm. um, that was like when he was his most raw, right. and you would you would feel and hear these things from him that maybe you wouldn't even hear off the stage, mm. and he's telling 10,000 people too, which is mm. awesome, <laughs> because you would think, oh, he wouldn't want to share his deep, darkest secrets, yeah, but yeah, yeah. actually that's where he shared his yeah. shit. Mm. Um, and and then when he would come off stage, he was, he was a pretty quiet guy. But yeah. you know, he would, you know, he would, he would get into it. No, yeah, that's nice. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think yeah, I don't know, just that that love for life, um, the love for the music, mm. um, yeah, yeah, just being yourself. Yeah. Did you um, now when you started playing with 
and getting into the soul music, mm-hmm. did it naturally, did you naturally connect to it? Like, you know, because here you are being trained differently, but then now you started playing those type of soul music, now being with Charles Bradley and Sharon Jones. Mm-hmm. Did it automatically just like connect to you or did it feel like I'm doing a job, I'm a trumpet player, I got to learn this stuff? Or this was something that it was already like, you know, because some people could fake the funk. I don't feel that from you. But, you know, people's like, it's a gig. I got to do this or whatever. Totally. Did it just snap all together as one playing that soul? Yes. <laughs> Definitely. I think mm-hmm. I had secretly been waiting my entire life. For that. <laughs> like, because I love jazz so much. But, like, part of it was getting a little old just because of the repetition and, like, just the, um, I don't know, it being a little too predictable yeah. almost mm-hmm. or at least the type of jazz that was like that's now right. know, or what we had been learning in school yeah. and so I, I was ready for something new mm. and but it was something old that was new uh. <laughs> and classically you know I'm, I feel like it was just in me all that time but it had just I just didn't know it mm. and so it just took that perfect meeting of me and, and Charles yeah. for it to happen it, it, it's speaking on, on Charles, I want to share my connection. I feel like I'm spiritually connected to this dude because uh, <laughs> it's just he kept, kept he just kept on coming up in my life. So, awesome. um, so I remember seeing him at BB uh, King's when he was doing oh, okay. uh, <clears throat> he was doing uh, James Brown impersonation, yep. Yep. right? Black Velvet, yep, Black yeah. Velvet. <laughs> and I was like, man, this guy is dope, right? <laughs> uh, then cut to probably like a year later or maybe two um, on YouTube when I'm Google just searching new soul music because I'm like I I know there's soul music somewhere being played and I want to know what's out there cool I see Charles Bradley um, what was that uh, playing uh, KEXP there you go yeah. there yeah. and I saw the, the video of um, the world going up in flames yep uh, so I'm like Oh man, like this music is dope. The guy also, uh, we both grew up in the same area in Brownsville. Oh wow! So I'm just like, that's dope. So I connected to him even more. Yeah. Been seeing him play around the Bowery Ballroom and stuff, and I saw him play like five times. Then the deeper connection was, um, I get off the four train on 59th and Lex, hey. and I get out. And there goes Mr. Bradley sitting down, yes. waiting for the train. <laughs> I go to him uh-huh. and speak to him. Humble dude, awesome. We're sharing even like stuff of like, yeah, I've been on the road a lot. It's, 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 it was wearing tear on me. I'm kind of tired, blah, 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 but I'm going to keep on going. Sharing those moments. He didn't know me at all, yeah. but sharing those moments with, with me, and I'm just talking to him. Right. And then I say, I was like, Charles, did you ever, I was like, did you ever play? Because and where I grew up in the projects, um, right across the street is like the old folks uh, building and all the old people live there and they would do a block party. Mm. I remember every summer they would do the block party and I would be by my window because they had persons, uh, people playing soul music. Yeah. And I remember looking, playing, uh, this guy playing uh, James Brown. And I would be so fascinated because I just love soul music. This is what I want to do. And I said, Charles, let me ask you something. Did you ever used to play around, like, the back of 395, the building, blah, blah, and do James Brown? He says, oh, yeah, I used to always do that. I said, Charles, I, I've been seeing you since I was, like, 10 or, like, 12 no. years old. That's so sick. So I'm like, that is amazing. <laughs> You've been, like, an influence on me, like, for so long since and little. <clears throat> since yeah. little. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Cut to, it doesn't even end there. <laughs> Cut to uh, me and my wife. We wasn't married yet. Uh, mm. We was, uh, long story short, I was in the friend zone, then the bro zone, then I became uh, the love zone. Yes. <laughs> so I came, I came from go. the upside down. <laughs> <laughs> I came out of it. The, I didn't drink the tea from Get Out. Like yeah, I, I came back. I, you know, I was oh, like, God. I'm coming back, baby. I'm coming back. So, but what helped? Yeah. I was putting on to her a lot of soul music that was out there. Mm. So we having moments. You know, in the living room, I was like, have you ever, um, no, I was afterwards. So the YouTube was like on the playlist, random playlist of the soul I was playing. Uh, 
since I've been loving you comes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Charles Bradley. Yeah, yeah. Loving you, baby. Loving you, baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Loving you, baby. Yeah. Comes on. Yeah. I was like, have you been listening to Charles Bradley? And she's like, no. Mm. So That's she a good listened. One. To, she listened. To, <laughs> we did our first slow dance to Charles Bradley. Yo. Now this guy, thank you, Charles. Uh, he's been blessing me because even after that, probably like as I'm still trying to like win her over and stuff like that, and I'm doing good, you know. Probably like another month later, like a, you know, we're getting deeper with our love. The song comes on again randomly. We even put you put them on YouTube. It just comes up again. So that's been our slow dance song. So this guy has been mm-hmm. all around. And then when I met you at Kelly Finnegan, yeah. I said, Charles, if if this is you somehow, like I would love right. to take a lesson from this dude. Totally. So I know you're probably watching from somewhere. And I said, I said, maybe Charles, you're gonna hook it up somehow. Yeah. And then boom, here you are right in front of me doing boom. this podcast. Yep. So he's still hooking it up. Yeah, he's still hooking it up. <laughs> so um, love to do. Uh, yes, me too. Um, so now I'm gonna read something from uh, your, your record company, mm. uh, Dollar Records. Yeah. And it, and and it's something you pretty much what you guys the slogan what you guys go by. Oh yeah. You know to cultivate organi- organic music and share it with the world. How did Dollar Records come to be? And the Hive Mind Recording Studio. Mm. How did that all come to be where it's at now? And I yes. love what you guys are doing and how Thanks, the organic music and sharing it with the world. Because that's what it's about at the end of the day, creating something from within and then now sharing it with everybody else. Totally, man. Um, well, back to CB. A lot <laughs> of it had to do with him. Mm. Uh, yeah, so I was living on St. Mark's when I first joined Charles Band. And I basically set up a little bedroom studio in my apartment and I bought a four track cassette machine and a microphone and then like another tape machine from this crazy guy named Larry Seven, Mm. who's dope. He's like East Village OG guy. Mm. Um, And so that was my little rig and I started writing songs in my apartment inviting uh friends over who were either in charles's band or in my old band mfa Mm. uh to be side musicians Mm. and i was like starting a little thing yeah and then um got the idea really when i was done with the songs a Mm. couple songs like what am i gonna do with these like how am i gonna release this and the idea of just like pitching it or getting it with other labels just seemed too daunting to me right and so I and so I was just like, hmm, like I have all these songs, I have all these friends who are great musicians. I have a little bedroom studio. <laughs> Let's just start a shit, you know, a label yeah. right now. Do our own thing. And so that's how Dollar started. Um, it's named after my parents' initials, Dennis mm. and Lori. And uh, yeah, so for about a year or so, I was in my St. Mark's apartment recording. We had. We did our first single there with Camelia Hartman, a great singer who I'm still working with. Um, we did a full-length album wow. there with my good friend John Fathom, a folk singer, um, all in the four track. Nice. <laughs> and uh, we also did a couple other singles there, just little ones that we released. And so that was kind of like our like beginning stages, like kind of the foundation. Yeah. And the response was cool. Everyone was excited. I was excited. I was like, all right, we need to keep this going. So I moved to bed after that place. Um, and when I was in bed I was like, okay, I think I'm going to need more than just a bedroom mm. to do this. So Camelia, who I mentioned, uh, the singer, her family, who are very close to me, um, is from the East Village mm. originally, Lower East Side. East Village, um, and they had a house on 2nd Street that they had been uh, raised in, and it had this crazy basement with, like, 25-foot ceilings, <laughs> and because they had, like, taken the the basement floor mm. out and exposed the sub-basement, so, mm. and it was this 100-year-old brownstone. Super cool vibe. You could have not mapped this out even better. <laughs> Legit. And so I was like, yo... And they were 
happy to, to have me there. And so I brought in what I had at that point was an 8-track tape machine. It's this crazy one called the Tascam 3D8 that's kind of like the iconic, like high, mm -hmm. not hi-fi, lo-fi, bedroom, like do-it-yourself mm -hmm. recording setup that a lot of people are using right now actually to wow. make soul records because it has that like dusty, mm. dirty, gritty sh vibe. So I brought that and like a bunch of microphones uh, and like a piano, a Rhodes, a organ over to the Brownstone and Second Street, set up the live room in this like <laughs> pit and then ran a hundred foot snake audio cable to the like back greenhouse <laughs> which was my control room mm. where I had my tape machine. So I had a studio and basically I had access to that whenever I wanted, just not between three and five when they had yoga upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so those were our only parameters. And so I was like, okay, let's do this. So whenever I was back home from tour with Charles, I would book studio days there and either bring in singers or I'd be working on my own songs. Mm. And just started recording way more. And so we did a whole other album with John Fadham there. Um, had like some amazing musicians on that. Um, and then we did another single with Camellia, mm -hmm. which actually came out on 45 and turned into this like sleeper, mm -hmm. like DJ, like, you know, crazy record that people mm -hmm. all over the world now are like, we want that record. <laughs> and we did it in this like little tiny base. Those you know, are the best though. Those for sure. <laughs> Dude. And so this excitement around the whole thing started happening. And I was like, okay, this is like getting bigger. It's, you know, we're making better records. The songs are getting better. The productions are like getting, mm -hmm. you know, more sophisticated. And so basically I was there for a year and change, I think. And then when I moved from bed Actually, before that, they sold the house. They sold the Second Street house, which was a super bummer. Yeah. But I'm sad right now. I'm like, Yo, I know. It's a, it's a beautiful house. Um, but that's what led me to be like, where's my next studio? Mm. Hive mind. Mm. So basically, I was looking on Craigslist for just anything and everything. I find this listing in Bushwick, send it to Vince Kirito, who played bass with Charles and was also looking for a studio space at that time. Send it to him. He replies back. He's like, I just found that same one. I'm going tomorrow. Let's go. Wow. And so I go with him and one other homie, Mike Buckley, who played with Lee Fields at Kebe mm. Shakedown, was playing with Kelly at the Standard with on tenor. Mm. Um... So us three go, check it out. It's this like shitty industrial space in Bushwick, but we can see more the potential. Yeah, we <clears throat> see the, you know, what it could be. So we're like, fuck it. <clears throat> sign the lease, sign a five-year lease. Nice. <laughs> and start a building hive mind. Wow. By ourselves. Um, and I had zero experience building studios. <laughs> Vince had a little bit because he had come from another studio. Right. So he had a little bit of background. Mike, not so much, but he's strong. So he just like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> helped do shit. Yeah. <clears throat> we all actually got really buff. <laughs> sick. Like during mm. that. It, so it took us seven months to build the space. Uh, we built our own walls, our own ceiling, our own windows, our own doors, floors, everything. Wow. Um, all the audio is like run kind of custom throughout the space all the instruments are mostly ours so that was like a huge fucking project and just i don't know at that point i was like it's either this or i stop recording you know mm. or it's going to be way harder and i just don't see nothing else made sense right to me. you know i was like i i think this is what i wanted to mm -hmm. plus i was with two very good friends both of whom I trusted a lot. I had spent six years touring with Vince, many years with Mike on the road. So that bond mm. on the road yeah. definitely helped a lot. And so yeah, so after the first year, we were pretty much built. 
And so it became a commercial studio to pay the rent. And then it was ours after that. Like any other downtime, it's us. Yeah. And so lately we've been cutting some sick ass records there. <laughs> and one of which we're about to release uh, at the end of the summer, hopefully. Uh, with a new soul singer I met recently mm. who actually I met at the Nighthawk Cinema on the night of the Living on Soul Daptone screening. Nice. Which was this other moment. Yep. Charles yep. hooking it up. <laughs> and this guy Bobby was like looking for people to work with. I was there mm -hmm. also looking for people to work with. Our studio was about to be finished built, being built. And, um, that whole relationship spawned. Um, so we've been working with him, with Camellia, and it's also just spawned this crazy other life yeah. of other artists uh, who sometimes just book us, and then I'm like, you're dope. Let's mm. just keep working together yeah, yeah, yeah. on the side. And a lot of people wow. are do I'm doing that with now. Um, so awesome. the label is just like, what, what I love, what is it's just so inspiring yeah. to like one, two things, and I'm like connecting to this. It's just like mm -hmm. you know, whenever you are ready to plan kind of like your next move, it's always kind of like at a point where it's meant for you to start thinking that way. Because the moment you start going after it, no matter how challenging it is, like people like you start getting messages that it is meant to do that because things start forming naturally. And I'm always a firm believer of that. Like when things are happening organically, kind of like with the music you're creating yep. and naturally, then you know you're on the right path and that's where you need to be. Because if not, then you would have got, you wouldn't have a lot of these success moments or things mapping out the way they're supposed to. Right. Which is so great. And at the same time, it's inspiring because a lot of people who hear this, like, oh, I didn't have experience of how to build a studio. But I had a couple other people uh, research, you know, I have been playing. So, I have everything I need to figure this shit out. Totally. So that was me a hundred percent. You know, I was like, "How do I run this console? I have no idea what this does." <laughs> so one way to find out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then do trial and error, like yeah. in life, you learn yeah. and you 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 learn from your failures and you praise your success from it. So totally. I I think that's so amazing. And then you uh, connecting with other artists too organically. How that came out to be? I I, I think this whole story is just. Very inspiring. It's great, man. And yeah. seeing you, hearing you go through it, like, it's something that gives hope to a lot of other people that are in your position, you know? Totally. And then you're probably going to be in another crossroads, like, well, what's next for me? You know? Um, mm -hmm. I remember reading, too, that, uh, uh, you know, Charles Bradley kind of, like, heard some of the stuff and kind of, like, gave the, the blessing, too, as well. Yeah. Hearing it was like, yo, well, check this out. And he was like, it's dope. No, yeah. I don't know if he said that, but I'm just saying, like... <clears throat> I I was able to play him some, like, early stuff mm. from the label. It was actually some of my stuff that he mm. heard. And I was singing, like, falsetto, like, soul nice. ballads. And, <laughs> yeah. So, I'm happy, you know. I'm sad that he didn't get to hear what yeah, yeah. we're working on now. And, like, oh, all this stuff. It. But, he's hearing it. Um, you know, How did you transition to, like... To sing and be an artist and being comfortable with that or yeah. even learning to be comfortable with that you know yeah. now you're putting yourself out there uh on the front lines totally you know? man yeah uh i don't know i mean i think it definitely just came naturally from writing the songs that i was writing for other singers mm. um so that's kind of how it started i was just like writing tunes and i'd like you know i'd call a singer my friend Camelia would be like, you want to, you want to take a crack at this? But then some of them, you know, I'm like, I, I want to try and sing this. Mm. Like, I think I could do a good job and I might resonate with that song mm. more so than any other one. And so I think, you know, I want to send this message to nice. the world. Um, so yeah, it really just started, you know, from recording those songs and then, we, there would come a time where there'd be a show that something was happening where I was putting something together and there was a slot open and I was mm. like, hmm, maybe I should play a set. Mm. And so I just fucking did it. Was it a different <laughs> feeling for you being in that position and then playing trumpet and doing... 
Oh yeah. What was what was that? Massive, massive mm. difference. Just because it's a whole other instrument, and mm. I'm also playing piano at the same time, mm. which is also a second instrument for me. But there's something cool about it. It's again like me putting myself outside of my comfort zone. That's kind of a pattern. That's but, something that I, like, you know, <laughs> this, that I admire about you. Yeah. Like, yeah, truly, is uh, because you, you don't know how it's gonna play out, but you're gonna play it out for sure. <laughs> you're just gonna do it. Yeah, and, yeah. And the practice, of again, course. from the trumpet, like taught me. Okay, mm-hmm. you got your gig in two weeks. Just shed your shit, like mm-hmm. for every day till then. Mm-hmm. And you'll probably be good. Yeah. <laughs> like, and if you don't, you yeah. live the next day to do it again. Yeah. Like Book you do, show. Yeah. You go yeah. in. You like you. You go into the unknown, and you totally. You figure it out as you go. And I love the courage that you have to do that because a lot of people will honestly, well, a lot of people will, will use that and cripple them. You know, and they, they sure. won't. They won't make that next move. You know, they they won't take that lesson to learn. They won't make a, a change in their life that's positive because they just allow fear and doubt to, to cripple them and yeah. where you probably will still have those emotions but it doesn't cripple you it's like well i feel i'm gonna accept what i feel but i'm gonna go through it and then if it fail i'm gonna go through it again if it's great i'm gonna go through it again yeah. and that's been a constant thing that i noticed in your life mm. and so many things like you know from learning when the trumpet first came it was like oh i picked up the you picked up the trombone Come on, yeah. and he was like, oh, it's not for me but you know what i'll do the, the trumpet yeah from you moving to over here you know taking that big step yeah you know once again another position comes where the opportunity comes to go play you're in school like you just kept on moving forward and forward, yeah. and, forward and forward and i think that's a very inspirational Thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Hopefully, you can just keep on moving. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, Billy, we got to know you, like, pretty much the ins, the outs of everything, musically, creatively, yeah. uh, spiritually, how you, you know, how you see things. Yeah. And um, now we're going to go to the next segment real quick, and it's called yeah. Let's Look Inside. Okay. That's the first segment of that. And the first question for Let's Look Inside is, is there a meaning to life? If so, what is it to you? Mm. I would say yes. I hope so. <laughs> um, to me, the meaning to life, I mean, I would, I would think from what people like Charles have taught me is just, you know, really valuing the connections that you make with other mm-hmm. people, I think. Yeah. That's great. Like, without that, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, nothing matters because mm-hmm. we're all we got here. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there's animals, but, like, they don't, you know, animals are cool, but hey. people are cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I get you. No, the great. earth is great. Mm-hmm. We should take care of the earth. But, um, you know, we're all we got. And, like, we're, we got to stick together. Mm-hmm. And, like, if we don't do that, then shit's gonna hit the fan right and so i don't know we just gotta stay close and i think that's the biggest part at least up till now no that's great yeah the next question part of that is um if you can teach one concept to everyone in the world what concept will have the greatest impact one example that i always use is Mm. love yourself if Mm. you teach everyone how to love yourself the the world will be better you know what i'm saying so that will be a powerful concept that it will transcend so yeah. what would be a concept you would teach everyone in the world? I mean, I would say forgiveness. Mm. <laughs> that's a heavy one, but like... No, that's great. I think that's right. Because that's like, without that, you can't move forward. You can't rebuild or repair things, right? Mm. And people are always going to make mistakes. That's a fact. So it's just kind of how you get back from that, I think. That's powerful. Is, is the that's true. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people hold grudges, a lot of people, yeah. you know, sometimes we realize, oh, I'm forgiving you, but you're really forgiving yourself because you're allowing yourself to let go. Sure. So, so, and then you're forgiving that person as well for whatever they've done, and you're, you're moving forward from that. A lot of people still hold on to that and then it turns into like either anger, resentment, yep. and it turns even bigger than what it is. Yep. Um, yep. So I, I like that one. Um, <laughs> 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 like rapid fire yep. right here. 
The second segment is called Words from My Spiritual Teacher, Guru Enlightenment. Everyone knows that I have a spiritual teacher. She teaches spirituality, uh, which is to believe in yourself and knowing that you have a purpose in this world. And all the tools that uh, we have are inside to succeed in our life. And she gives free lessons, free workshops, and she has helped me in my life. So you guys already, by now, have been checking out her book, her uh, website, and know what she does and maybe reaching out to her now. So in this segment, I usually share some of her writings. Um, so this one comes from her book, um, Guru Enlightenment Guide to Finding Your Answers into the Unknown. And what I normally do, I just open the book and see and just write it down. Like I don't pinpoint it to whoever, but for some reason, it always connects to the episode. And awesome. I don't make it up. Awesome. So in this one, she goes, she says, when losing someone to death, you need to realize that they are gone for a short time. It's not like you won't see them again. You will, even if it's their spirit. Remember to give their life purpose. How? By continuing your life, making things work for you, and doing what you need to do to fulfill your journey. What do you think? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely connects with me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know what's so funny? <laughs> I didn't know how this was going to end up, right? Yeah. Everything that you shared today and reading this makes this come full circle. 100%. I know death is always uh, hard for me to uh, accept. I get it. But for instance, let's use Charles Bradley, for example. This guy has left lessons for you. Somehow, even in my life, <laughs> like yeah. he sent me messages and connected things. And I was open to receive them. But more about you is that you have lost not only people like Charles Bradley in your life, but other people in your life. The line is, you keep on going. Mm -hmm. You continue to fulfill your life with purpose and fulfill your journey. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's ex that's exactly your journey. Mm -hmm. When I look back on this, mm -hmm. I, I shared with you that that no matter what, wherever you're in a crossroads or something, things map out for you. And you figure it out. Even if you don't even know where it's going to lead, you still go. You build a relationship with Charles. It didn't stop there. You continued. Mm -hmm. And then he continued even now to build certain things when he was here and when he's on the other side now. Same thing with other people that you probably met. And it's so crazy to me that, you know, to see that and to, and, and to hear that. Um, and it's beautiful to see that through it all, you're still creating and being who you are. Yeah, man. I, I feel blessed for mm -hmm. sure. I mean, it, I've just, I feel so lucky to mm -hmm. like have had him and other people like him to like lead me in that direction because mm -hmm. it very well could have ne never happened. Right. Like, like you said, I had two opportunities. Mm -hmm. That second one could have never happened. Yep. Woo, they got it there. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. it's just a, it's a crazy thing how that all worked out. And it ties into, yeah. real quick, it ties into what you said, the meaning to life. Mm. When you said connections with people. Yeah. That's what you've been doing. Yeah. Like, all your life. These mm -hmm. connections that you value and appreciate is continuing to flourish in your life and mm -hmm. what you do well to people as well. Yeah, man. And that being said, you're going to start crying because uh, <laughs> there's the ending of the show. <laughs> the ending of the episode. I think that's a perfect way to end it, man. Thank you for checking out the episode. Please help us out by subscribing to our podcast, writing a review, sharing it with a friend, or leaving a comment. Thank you. This will help us so much.